Next on Broadway Profiles, Tony voting now underway. You'll hear from lots of this year's nominees. Plus, it's the most nominated play in Tony Awards history. We'll talk to the man who penned slave play, Jeremy O'Harris. And a little later, blindness off Broadway. For the first time in a year, live theater will return to New York City, and it's based on a best-selling novel. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. Welcome, I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's go ahead and talk Tonys. We still don't know when Broadway's biggest night will actually take place, but we do know the Tony Awards voting is now underway. Tony voters have until the 15th to make their picks. Just 18 shows are eligible for awards because of the COVID-shortened Broadway season. Slave Play was last season's most provocative show, and it's up for a dozen Tony Awards this year, a record for the most nods of any non-musical show in Tony history. Here's Broadway.com's editor-in-chief, Paul Wontorek, with a look. Hi, Paul. Thanks, Tamsin. You know, the Slave Play cast actually took their final bows before the shutdown, but over the past 14 months, it's still one of the most talked about shows, and visionary playwright Jeremy O. Harris is right there in the middle of the conversation. In addition to funding new work, he's also scored a big contract with HBO. Take a look. So, we're here with, what is it, most Tony-nominated, one-hit wonder, Jeremy O. Harris? That, that, that's, your, that's your Twitter name now? Yes, yes. Is that how you feel? It's just funny to me because I never wanted or thought that a play I would write would go to Broadway. The fact that it got so many Tony nominations, which was, I think, um, truly phenomenal because it showed how much um, work that not only I put into the play, but all of the people who worked on this play did. I did a speech to everyone and I was like, hey guys, so like, I don't think we're gonna get as many nominations as, you know, a lot of the other plays or a lot of the other shows um, because we're the new kids on the block. And right. we did something that made a lot of people uncomfortable. And the thing is, we got to do it. We got to start a lot of conversations. We were written about like crazy. So let's celebrate that and everyone go around and tell their best memory. So we all kind of gave weird like Tony speeches in this thing. <laughs> and we're like, okay, cool. Like, let's like, let's cross our fingers that like someone gets a nomination. And then to have that happen was just like, wait, what? You know, you're now like a record holder with 12 nom. I mean, this is the most honored play in Tony history. So it's, it's next level. It's really next level, especially because, you know, the plays that have held this before were some truly seminal pieces of work. The play that held it for most of my life was Angels in America. Okay. And that for me is the height of the American theatrical canon. And, you know, Tony Kushner came to an early preview of Slave Play and um, sent me a gorgeous letter. And so to know that like, that was a play that we that like we've matched in a lot of ways uh in nominations and in sort of like cultural uh discourse um yeah. means the world to me so where does broadway fit in if it, if it, it was never really what you were writing for so how does it sort of fit into your goals now well i think what's exciting is that you know um obviously the broad the reason i have such a dense history of Broadway is because a lot of radical work I love started like was on Broadway because in the 70s, it was, especially the 70s, it was like not a question to put a play like uh, Intozaki Shange's For Color Girls on Broadway, right. right? And so I think that what I'm really excited about now is creating the, in this new decade of the 2020s, a new class of Broadway theater makers um, who are making more uh, non-conforming work, more uh, challenging work and exciting work and helping other artists find that audience while also putting some of my work there. Even when I said yes to my HBO deal, I said yes to my HBO deal with the caveat that they had to help me support theater and that I have to be able to like, like say like, it's really great doing the show right now, but I'm gonna take some time off to work on this play on Broadway. It's like when, uh, when Michael Jordan was playing basketball. He's always gonna be a great basketball player, but he also wanted to golf and he also wanted to play baseball because he loved those things as well. Right. Did he play baseball or golf as well as he played basketball? No, but he did it and he had fun. And so I see television and film and fashion like my golf and my baseball, things that I've always loved and things that I'm good at, but not necessarily my primary uh, 
spirit building practice. Um, theater is. Before the shutdown, I had a chance to talk with one of the stars of Slave Play, Tony nominee for Best Actress, Jakina Calacongo. Talk about the first time you reading it or seeing it. The first time I read it, it had me feeling so many feelings. I laughed, I cried, I was angered, um, I was triggered. I was a bunch of things while reading it. So to talk about those feelings, because those are feelings that the audience is going through too, for you to be shocked by something is a big deal. Oh yes, and, and more so, I was interested in, in uh, what the audience would respond to because we're all different. And so certain things hit certain notes in certain ways, certain nights. As a black woman, I'm like, how are people feeling? How are black people feeling after seeing this? Are you okay? What's the steps? And how are people listening to each other? Do you feel validated? Do you feel honored? Or do you feel triggered? Last week, somebody special in the audience talk about who was here and how you, how and when you found out Rihanna was in the audience. Oh my gosh, Rihanna. We found out while we were on stage, like literally before we started the show. It was the craziest experience of the night because you could hear the audience applaud her as she walked down the aisle. And to hear her voice, to hear her laughing, and to hear her come back and just really be this great energy of warmth and love and support and like knowing she enjoyed the show and her song is playing throughout this show. It was crazy. We're like, oh. The Tina Turner musical is one of this past season's most celebrated shows with a dozen Tony nominations. I talked to two of those nominees, the show's playwright, Katori Hall, and the man who plays Ike Turner, Daniel J. Watts. I want to say congratulations to both of you. First off, um, can you give me your reaction upon hearing the news? I think we probably had the same reaction, this thing of like, yay! Oh, but the world is really messed up right now. Yeah. Uh, just bittersweet, bittersweet, but I must say that, you know, it's an honor. It's an honor to be uh, celebrated with what I think is the most amazing show ever. Hey, it's like, this mostly sweet, like they say, a bittersweet. It's inside of a bubble. You can't really go show, you know, all your fellow nominees. You can't hug, you can't hug each other. You know, the family, you know, 12 nominations. We couldn't celebrate it together, um, you know. And then to be honest, I was met with a lot of love that I just didn't expect. And it almost eclipsed the nomination itself. Like just to, just to have the support system especially in that space, you know, Ike Turner, like you just feel alone a lot in that space. So just know, just to have that many people like rooting and you remember everything, like every moment that led up to, you know, just like the, the announcement. So it was, it was really cool, but also, and then in a bubble. <laughs> you're saying you feel alone sometimes when you're in a, when you're playing a character like that. And I, I never thought about that, but it is, I, I can understand it when you, when you, when you say it like that, how does that feel? Ooh, Ike was hard. Ike was, Ike was hard. It starts with, you know, people even coming to see the show, they're coming with their arms folded, you know. <laughs> he is who he is. He did what he did to a person that we all love and care about, you know. So there's, there's a, and there's also the wanting to hold on to that version of Ike coming in, you know. So there's a little bit of a betrayal when you start to try to humanize this individual that people have decided is only a monster. And also coming from the ensemble, like I'm used to having, I'm used to being a part of the tribe in that way, always being in some scene in the, you know, and I, this sure. is my first time in a Broadway show where I wasn't doing that. So it just, I just had moments that, you know, that's always in therapy every Friday. And we were so lucky to have you, Daniel, to step into that role because I feel as though you were able to show how charming he was, how genius he was. I mean, this is the father of rock and roll. And to also just be able to get to the vulnerability of him. It's like, you know, even people who are doing bad things in the world, you know, they cry, they have resentment, they hurt. And so, I mean, Daniel just was, you know, showing that in spades on, on stage. And so like, I always say like, we are so, so blessed to have him. What do you want to say to, the, to fans and uh, people that are ready for Broadway to, to come back and just waiting? This intermission is going to end. The curtain is going to come back up. It's, it's going to happen. And so in the meantime, support these artists, donate to the Actors Fund. Um, we, we are struggling out here and, and that struggle is going to be long, but it's people who love the arts and understand the power of theater that's going to pull us all through. 
Jagged Little Pill is the most nominated show of 2020. We had a chance to talk to one of the Tony nominated stars of Jagged Little Pill, Elizabeth Stanley. I mean, I've always felt really grateful to be a part of a show that has something to say, that does have some depth to it, actually has quite a bit of depth to it. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, Alanis's whole kind of like mantra with the show is that it's about human connection and, you know, transparency and being honest about who we are. And I think whether or not we like it, <laughs> we're all forced to really lean into all those things in this moment. I mean, it. it it is a bizarre time, but I think it's, I feel really grateful to have, you know, a moment to celebrate something. I think like it, during this time, we all have to remember to be joyful. And if there is something to be joyful about, it feels, I don't, I feel like I have a deeper reason to like really celebrate. I have to get dressed up. I mean, I know some people are like, whatever, I'm just gonna be in my sweats, but it's my first Tony nomination. It's like a moment I've been dreaming about for my whole life. So I do think that even if it's just, you know, a fancy pair of jeans. I'm gonna be dressed up. <laughs> you got that something that I, 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 I'm so glad we're friends. So you're single in Paris? Let's talk about Broadway stars on TV because Emily in Paris continues to be one of the most bingeable shows on Netflix. Plus, it features a recent Tony nominee from the Broadway smash hit Mean Girls. Take a look. Paris is the most exciting city in the world. And you never know what's gonna happen next. It was my first time ever in Paris. So I was like, this is the running joke was that it was Ashley in Paris. We're like, what's going on in that show right tonight? Like, you know? So, um, and I, you know, me coming from the Broadway world too, and I, I, I really hadn't had any time off, you know, from eight shows a week. So I've always wanted to travel. I've always wanted to study abroad and I never got to do those things. And so I felt like I was meeting a soulmate when I first got there. I was like, oh, everything that I've loved, like everything from fashion, different foods, like different lifestyle. I was like, this is my exact fit. Wait, we don't get to drink it? It's so expensive. Relax, they'll buy more. Sante. Sante. You know, it's so funny with, especially with the show dropping globally while everyone's still isolated in pandemic. Um, right. It was wild, you know? And uh, I think we are just so happy that it's made so many people happy. I don't think, you know, I think we knew that people were gonna enjoy it, but I don't think we expected or even thought about the kind of reception that it's gotten so far. We live in the live performance world, in the Broadway world, where like I've done how many thousands of live performances now, and like every person in my life, from every walk of my like friends, families, people I haven't talked to in years, every person has watched it or is about to. So it's just, it's so crazy. Still plenty more to talk about on this edition of Broadway Profiles. Up next, it's a best-selling novel, a film starring A-list actors, and now the first live theatrical experience in New York City since the start of this pandemic. An inside look at blindness when we come back. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching Broadway Profiles. Live theater will soon be coming back to New York City. It's not quite Broadway, but it's another step toward much needed normalcy. Let's go ahead and send it back to Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper with the story. Thanks, Tamsin. The critically acclaimed playwright Simon Stevens is up for yet another Tony Award. We spoke to him about his new sound installation, Blindness, set to be the first New York City indoor theater experience during COVID-19. You, of course, adapted Jose Saramago's novel, Blindness, into a production that's um, been playing in London. What was that like? It was, it was just extraordinary. I mean, it was, a, it was, a, it was an adaptation that I, ha I have to say I was working on for some time before uh, the lockdown. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a kind of speedy um, right. the pandemic and decision to, to adapt a novel about a pandemic um, in a pandemic. It's something I've been working on for years. It's, it's really interesting because it was made into a movie as well. There was a, there was a Julianne Moore movie uh, about kind of 10 years ago that was a much more, had a much bigger, bigger constellation of characters and kind of cast every, every one of the characters and built entire cities. 
we made a binaural sound recording, uh, and I, which is which is absolutely. I don't know if you're familiar with binaural sound recordings. No. But they're they're the most crazy things, right? <laughs> a binaural microphone is a microphone that is shaped like a human skull. Huh. And, and it's got three microphones embedded within the human skull. And what it does is the recordings replicate, when played back, the three-dimensional experience in which the recordings were made. Oh, wow. So if you go up That's to the microphone and you whisper in the left ear, the recording uh, sound, when you listen back on headphones, it sounds like Juliet Stevenson is whispering. Wow left ear and if you if she kind of runs screaming through the room it captures that completely so it's an incredibly dynamic and exciting way of listening to the listening to the recording of the show in london it was the first piece of theater that was made since the start of the pandemic since the start of the lockdown and for people to gather to experience this event this installation for the, for the public to come and, and experience it, well, it, it felt really profound. I know you guys did well in London and now you're coming to the Daryl Roth Theater this fall in New York during COVID-19. Yeah. It was incredible. You guys are like leading the way as far as reopening up theater in the midst of a pandemic. What does that feel like? I, I'm so excited. I'm really, really excited. I, I don't, the terrible thing is I don't know if I'm gonna be able to come. Yeah. So I, I I love New York so deeply, yeah. but I don't know whether it's going to be safe or legal for me to come with the show. So I'm I've never I've never been envious of 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 a piece of work before. <laughs> I'm really envious of my own piece of work. It gets to go to New York when I don't. <laughs> Coming up on this edition of Broadway Profiles, another Tony nominee joins us to talk about Milan Rouge the musical and more. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching Broadway Profiles. For the latest Broadway news and buzz, we'll send it over to Broadway.com's editor-in-chief, Paul Wontorek. Hey, Paul. Thanks, Tamsin. Three of the biggest Broadway hits of the 21st century are going Hollywood. First in theaters is Dear Evan Hansen, the 2017 Tony Award winner for Best Musical. Under the direction of Stephen Chbosky, the film adaptation arrives this September. It stars Ben Platt as the teenager whose little white lie takes him on an emotional journey of self-discovery. Joining him are Oscar winner Julianne Moore as his mom, Amy Adams as the welcoming mom next door, and up-and-comer Caitlin Deaver as love interest Zoe Murphy. John M. Chu, the acclaimed director of the film Crazy Rich Asians, is bringing his vibrant aesthetic to two movie musicals sure to excite fans. First up is In the Heights, his adaptation of Lin-Manuel Miranda's first Tony-winning hit. I am Usnavi, and you probably never heard my name. Reports of my fame are greatly exaggerated. Morning, Usnavi. Pan caliente, café hey. con leche. The film was delayed last year, but will now premiere in movie theaters and on HBO Max this June. Now, Chu has been tapped to bring one of the biggest musical hits ever to the screen. Yes, Alphaba and Glenda might finally be ready for their Hollywood moment because the long in the works Wicked film is on the fast track with Chu at the helm. Of course, The Wizard of Oz prequel has been a popular blockbuster since premiering on Broadway in 2003. No word on who will defy gravity in the coveted leading roles, but let the dream casting begin. That's it for me. Back to you, Tamsin. Paul, thank you. We'll be right back. We 
tears on my soul, sisters. Let me hear your flow, sisters. I think one of the things we miss most about Broadway is that instant rush you get when you step into the theater and you see the stage for the very first time. Well, even before the actors take that stage, the design of the set can capture your imagination and just take you away. And one of the masters of that craft is Derek McLean. This year, his work is nominated for two Tony Awards for Milan Rouge and A Soldier's Play. Moulin Rouge is a very romantic story, uh, but it's of course based on the movie, which is sort of rooted in a kind of maximalist excess. Um, that's part of the fun of it. And um, honestly, I've never done anything as sort of extreme and, and over the top as Moulin Rouge ever in my life. It is, it is, I think, probably the most elaborately designed set of I've ever designed. And then a soldier's play, on the other hand, when you read this script, there's so many flashbacks, there's so many jumps forward and backwards in time, and just figuring out how do you, how do you make that function? How do you make that work on stage and not get in the way? How do you, you know, give enough information for the audience that they, they understand where they are, they understand the time and the period, but that you're not, you know, the design is not getting in the way of the flow of that script. Well, that's going to do it for us. Until next week, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com.